Of all the hundreds of thousands of pieces of space junk and nearly 1500 satellites in orbit around the Earth, it may come as a surprise to know that there has only been one major collision involving a manned spacecraft and it affected both the Russians and the Americans. After the Apollo moon landings, the US switched its long-term goal to the space shuttle system and the Soviet Union shifted its focus to a permanent working presence in space. During the 1970s, the Soviet design bureau OKB-1 developed the first manned space stations called Salyut. As the Salyuts came to the end of their working life, a new permanent space station was created that would become known as Mir. To the men and women on board, Mir was in many ways a world away from Earth above which they passed more than 15 times a day at an altitude of 230 miles or 360 kilometers. The 130 ton habitation was able to support human life with a resupply just three times a year via the automated Progress cargo vessels. But when the USSR dissolved in 1991, the crew of Mir found themselves operating a space station with an uncertain future. Mir went from a Soviet space station to a Russian space station and just as the Soviet Empire fell away leaving just Russia, so did the budget for space programs like Mir, and the newly formed Russian space agency was hamstrung by lack of funds and infighting between the powerful design bureaus. This scared the Americans. If the Russian space agency failed, there would be a lot of highly qualified but unemployed rocket engineers looking for work, and countries like Iran and North Korea would be more than willing to give them new jobs. In June 1992, the new Russian President Boris Yeltsin and the US President George H.W. Bush announced a program of cooperation between the two nations. Basically, the US would supply funds to keep the Russian space agency afloat and the Russians would share their expertise in long-term manned space operations. They would also allow regular space shuttle missions to visit and service Mir, and in addition, NASA would fund additional space station modules, which would otherwise have been scrapped. One of these was named Spectre and was docked with Mir in 1995, originally a US military project to test anti-missile defense systems, Spectre was reconfigured adding 700 kilos of American equipment and instruments and would also become the living quarters for visiting American astronauts arriving on the shuttle. The Spectre module would also help keep the lights on. Mir was suffering from electrical shortages due to its aging solar panels. A second row of solar panels replaced Spectre's original military hardware, doubling the total power generation. By February 1997, Mir had already exceeded its expected operational life of five years twice over, but the Russian space station apparently still had a future. However, astronauts arriving with Expedition 23 were immediately met with a reminder of Mir's aging systems. As their Soyuz spacecraft approached the station, the automatic docking system was misaligned. With seconds to go, the module commander had to override the automatic controls and dock the Soyuz manually. Mir's automated docking system, known as KERS, had become a concern. It was manufactured by a Ukrainian company and due to issues with the currency exchange was charging the equivalent of around $2 million for each flight. The Russian space agency, looking to save money, was considering doing away with KERS altogether if possible. Expedition 23 was scheduled to carry out tests on a backup docking system known as Teleoperated Rendezvous Control System or TORU. This system gave the commander a view of the arriving craft through a remote camera and the ability to control the remote spacecraft with two joysticks. In March, Commander Vasily Sobliev performed the first test, undocking progress from Mir, moving to a parking orbit, then making an approach to redock. However, the Toru screen just showed static and the crew could only gaze through the windows as the dark shape of progress sailed past just 200 meters away. Afterwards, Moscow ground control identified the source of the interference as the antenna for the KERS automated docking system, which provided Toru with range telemetry. They decided that on the next test, they would switch off the antenna and the crew would instead track the cargo vessel through the station's windows using a handheld laser rangefinder and a stopwatch to find its speed and distance. 
part of a crew on the day of the test was the British-born American NASA astronaut Michael Fole. On June 25th, 1997, Sibliev was ordered to carry out the test. This time, the remote camera feed was working. The cargo vessel was in a parking position about five kilometers away. The first problem the crew had was just locating the vessel. Then, after initiating the vessel's approach, they had no measurements of how far or how fast it was traveling. Commander Sibliev struggled to make out the shape of the space station on his screen against the white clouds of the Earth below. And using the TV camera alone, he found it very difficult to determine how fast the cargo vessel was traveling or its distance from Mir. To try and work out the speed and distance, Michael Fole was given a laser rangefinder and told to look out for the supply ship. But his line of sight to the vessel from Mir was obscured by the solar panels. By the time they had located the cargo vessel, it was about 150 meters away and traveling fast. Sibliev applied the braking thrusters, but the craft was traveling too fast to stop in time. As can be seen in this footage of a remote camera view, Sibliev is heard telling Michael to get out and go to the Soyuz return craft as the cargo vessel approaches. As the cargo vessel sailed past the docking port, it hit a solar array, then the Spectre module, breaching the hull. Inside Mia, decompression alarms sounded and the whole station rocked and entered a slow spin. If the crew could not contain the breach, they would have less than 30 minutes of air left and they would have to abandon the station. They scrambled to cut the cables through the hatch to Spectre and eventually sealed off the module. But that wasn't the only problem. Mia was now spinning because of the collision and the solar panels were moving away from the sun and soon the power would fail. The main computer powered down and the usually noisy station went silent. For the next day, the crew worked in darkness, mopping up condensation from the station walls and diagnosing the damage from the collision. Slowly tumbling, Mia only had power to communicate with ground control when the solar panels caught the sun. Peering out through the windows of the airlock, Michael Fole used a sailor's technique with a scientist's knowledge of physics to estimate the station's rotation against the stars. Using this data, Russian ground control fired Mir's onboard engines and stabilized the spin enough to regain the power once more. After the collision, the cargo vessel was moved away from Mir and deorbited to burn up on re-entry. Over the coming weeks, a series of intravehicular activity operations in the depressurized module allowed restoration of 70% of Mir's power, but the breach in Spectre's hull was never repaired and the experiments on board, mostly American, had to be abandoned. Unsurprisingly, the Kurs automated docking system was never phased out, and a more advanced version is used today to dock the Soyuz and Progress craft with the International Space Station. Mir lasted until March 23, 2001, when the funding for the new International Space Station forced the Russian space agency's hand to abandon the aging Mir. It was finally deorbited, burning up over Fiji, and the ISS took over as man's only permanent outpost in space. So thanks for watching. I'd just like to say that this episode's shirt was the Trip Flames by Madcap England and is available at atomretro.com with worldwide shipping from here in the UK. We also have the Curious Droid Facebook page. The link is in the channel page. And I'd also like to take the time to thank all of our Patreons for their ongoing support. And if you would like to support us, then please visit our Patreon page and the link showing. So as always, thanks for watching and please subscribe, rate and share.